one of the most difficult things to realize tradition is because our experience is all encoded by a process, and the process is language. So that the very tape upon which experience records is itself a language process which has a ritual substructure built into its very operation. The ritual substructure of the tape of experience makes an impress upon experience which takes a balance to overcome. The balancing that overcomes the ritual staticness of the substructure of the tape of experience, that balance creates a kind of fog around the tape, an energy field around the tape, so that the ritual staticness is balanced by a cloud of resonance. And we experience this cloud of resonance as an interiorization of language. So that language has a double quality to it. It has a ritual substructure that tends to maintain itself very accurately in repetitions. And it also, at the very same time, has a concomitant structure that tends to increase in its imaginative, experimental variations. So that language has both a repetition and a variation at one and the same time. The repetition is ritualistic. The variation is mythic. So that the very nature of language has this built in. Now, we do not know how all languages began, but we do now know how written languages began. And perhaps a short recounting of how written languages began can give us some idea of why this ritual substructure needs to be overcome, why there needs to be a balancing interiorization to language because of the repetitive static quality of the ritual substructure of language. Language is creative precisely because it needs to be, because it is uncreative in one aspect of its process. Written language has its roots about 8,000 BC or about 10,000 years ago. About 8,000 BC, for the first time in the archaeological record, there are small little clay objects which have come to be called tokens. They're shaped like little desks. They're shaped like little pyramids. They're shaped like little spheres. They're shaped like little cylinders. There are a number of shapes, but initially there's a limited variety, and these tokens are counters. They count animals. They count groups of baskets of things. And they are the simple record. They're simply tokens that stand for. They represent a physical object. Now, these tokens that begin about 8,000 BC begin in the highlands of the Iranian Plateau and in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, especially the Euphrates rather than the Tigris. Before 8,000 BC, 
the archaeological digs at about 8500 BC do not show tokens anywhere in the world. Whereas at about 8000 BC, they began to be seen. And progressively, over about a thousand years, they are seen across a landscape that goes from the Eastern Mediterranean to the Caspian Sea down to the entrance into the Persian Gulf. So that that whole swath, which becomes later on in historical times, at the beginning of historical times, becomes the Fertile Crescent. These counters, these tokens, are an indication of what is called numeracy. That man has learned to write numerical quantities of things. This quantitative origin of written language lasts for, well, up until about 2,000 years ago. Clay tokens are still made even 2,000 years ago. But about 3,000 BC, or 5,000 years after the introduction of tokens, is the first radical major change in these tokens. The tokens by that time have more varieties, but they begin for the first time to be incised with lines, with squiggles, with dots. The tokens that were simply geometric shapes were collected together and stored in clay envelopes, which are not like manila envelopes at all, but simply clay spheres that are hollowed out, usually by the thumb, and they were stored inside. And so a group of, say, a dozen or so tokens would be sealed for protection and for accounting purposes. And whatever was inside of this clay so-called envelope was indicated by simply impressing the tokens on the outside of the wet clay. So the outside of the envelope had simply the impression, the token impression, so that numerical origins, numeracy, is based upon a simple one-for-one -one correspondence, a representation of severely and strictly limited exactness. The sign is simply what it is. The token stands for, there's a certain token for a cow, there's another token for a pig. The pig token never is a cow. There's no metaphor at that level at all. There's no mixing, there's no chimeras. So at the very ritual, numerical origins of written language, there is this strict referential one-for-one -one sign quality, the token. The unincised tokens were kept in clay envelopes. The incised tokens were always perforated and kept on strings. Because the incised tokens were, had a lot of variety. One of the earliest locations of incised tokens was Susa, ancient Shush. Susa, or Uruk, Susa up in the Iranian plateau, Uruk down in the Euphrates Valley. There were almost 200 varieties of incised tokens in the archaeological record of Susha. And the archaeological record of Susha vis-a-vis -vis tokens is just a smattering because they were usually thrown away or discounted as little scraps or as children's game pieces. The archaeological record didn't recognize until about 20 years ago the deep significance of these objects. So even with just a small cursory sampling, a place cosmopolitan like Susha had several hundred varieties, and with the incised tokens, many, many different varieties, and so they could not be put away. For the impressions on the clay envelopes were never fine enough, so they were strung to be kept track of. 
But from time to time, complex business organizations required the mixing of the two types and required the sealing and sending of them or the preserving. And so the incised tokens that initially were kept on strings, like a necklace, or kept on strings and then deposited, say, on pegs or in open cases, needed to be kept in the sealed envelopes. And so the introduction of a stylus, which would impress the incised lines on the token onto the envelope, and very rapidly, within several hundred years, within about 10 generations, the incised lined tokens on the envelopes of clay were seen to be all that was necessary to keep a record, and so the tokens were dispensed with. The hollowness of the envelope was dispensed with. It was crushed a little flatter and became the tablet, the original clay tablet upon which cuneiform and the wedges and lines of cuneiform developed from the incised lines of the tokens. And eventually writing came out of this and early cuneiform tablets are usually palm sized, held in the hand and slightly convex on one side and flattened on the other, which allowed for writing without smearing. Now the original tablets from about 4000 BC to about 3500, 3300 BC have this kind of clumsy beginning and what characterizes the order of the incised lines, the purely descriptive origins of written language, the ritual impressions, the mechanical reproduction of simple sign reference, was that they read from right to left and the line from right to left was always put into rectangular boxes so that each sign was given a specific mechanically distributed static sequence that was kept caged by rectangles and the original tablets were wider than they were tall. About 3000 BC, an enormous radical change happened in written language. The introduction of added meanings for signs made of it a language which was now image-based rather than sign-based. The pictographs were images that gave you an impression of what they were talking about, not simply a mechanical impression of what they were representing mechanically. At that stage, writing had a radical change. The tablets, instead of being wider when they were high, became higher when they were high, uh, wide, so they became page-like, and the writing shifted so that it went from left to right rather than from right to left. And they were no longer in rectangular boxes, but simply went, ran along lines of sight, or sometimes lines that would be drawn on the clay, and they would just follow those lines. So instead of being pictographs that were mechanical, from right to left in ritual rectangles, they now became lines of expression that ran from left to right and were on a page and there was absolutely nothing inside of the page. The tablet became much thinner. It was in no way a crushed clay envelope to hold objective things. But the very nature of the page in written language has implicitly 
in its whole process of development at its ur level. The ritual assumption that within the page are the things themselves, which stand for objects in the world. So that numbers, numeracy itself, numbers are useful because they are severely and strictly delimited to a sign, a token-like quality. Two, in order to be useful, has to always be two. It cannot be approximately two. It must be two, pure and simple. So the numerical origins of written language have this ritual substructure that carries over into the language, carries over into the very straight uh, nature and structure of language. So that vocabulary and grammar, syntax, tend to want to have ritualistic rules, whereas the actual use of language always transcends those ritualistic rules. A living language always colors outside the lines of what is grammatically or syntactically correct or permitted. New words come into usage. New combinations of words, new meanings for old words. So that dictionaries evolve, and the further that we go along with a written based civilization, the faster that this seems to happen. The great Oxford English Dictionary, based on etymological principles, that was started by um, uh, Murray in the uh, uh, 1870s was finished in 1928. They spent almost 50 years making the Oxford English Dictionary. I have in my library a first edition of all the big red leather volumes with the gold stamping, each volume about three, four inches thick. And here is this magnificent half million word ocean Every word in the English language, with every usage ever given to it down through history, they read every scrap, every book, every document in English completely. This is the Oxford way of doing things. And when it was finished in 1928, it was assumed by the Victorian founders of the Oxford English Dictionary that this would last for all time. It would be like Pinini's Sanskrit dictionary that 2,000 years later is still the arbiter. Within 50 years, the Oxford English Dictionary had supplements that were almost as large as volumes because the language had changed so much and so they had to have a completely new edition because the supplements were filled with so much living, used language that the original Oxford English Dictionary of 1928 was a museum piece. It was good for only historical, archival purposes, not useful at all as a dictionary. Can you imagine? Now, language is the medium by which myth occurs, and it's a process, and we're going to investigate this next. But just as Myth has a ritual substructure. Language, as the process of myth, also has a, that ritual substructure. And so there is a quality to the very structural nature of language which indexes experience, which does not allow for the ritual process to happen without some kind of regression. In other words, language does not maintain its ritual form in a mythic flow without encountering some kind of regressive quality. The very ritual substructure of language, of words, the numeracy behind literacy, 
has a tendency to pull language back to the ritual level. And because it has a tendency to pull it back to an objectivization, the creative quality, the coloring outside the lines of language, tends to make a future objective, a future objectivity to language to balance the ritual objectivity, which is trying to pull language back into its original forms. This future objectivity is the symbolic level. And because experience has this quality of being like a resonance around the ritual tape, the existential action of occurrence, the very thing that words are, the very things they stand for on a ritual level, tends to have this resonance, and this resonance creates an interior space. So that experience is this interiorization of language. And we will see that the whole mythic process is one where interiorization begins to increase, and as it increases, it creates an interior world, a whole interior realm, an interior realm which has a dimensionality which relates to the world of things because it has a ritual substructure that is a part of that realm. And through the world of things, it relates to the process of nature. But at the same time, in this balancing, it's like a polarity, if you like, at first. It's ultimately a complementarity, but it's like a polarizing effect. The more that one tries to cage a language into its ritual, numerical substructure, its mechanicalness, the more the interiorization seeks to complement that or to polarize and balance that out. Psychologically, one can observe that someone who tries to be extremely strict in their actions, extremely strict, in their language, there's a tendency upon those people to experience increased fantasization, increased imagination. And someone who gets stuck of insisting on a ritual connection always being correctly placed at the very same time is most susceptible to uh, wild clouds of uh, imaginativeness. So that fantasy and strictness pair up. They polarize. They come together. And the reason that they come together is by the very nature of the real. They must come together. They must be together. And the whole process of maturation is not to try to X out one or the other, but to bring the two into a focus. And when the two are brought into a focus, when the ritual substructure, the correctness of action, and a language which obeys the correctness of action, respects the existence the necessity, the practicality of things. When a language respects the practicality of things and their nature, then the image quality becomes resonantly around this tape, as it were, and orders itself so that the images order themselves. And when the images are ordered, along a ritual tape of correctness, one says then that there's a definite beginning, there's a definite end, 
and there's a definite middle in between the beginning and the end. And the Greek word for that language image string that runs from a definite beginning to a definite end with a definite sequence in between is a, the word for that in Greek was mythos. A myth is a plot, a plot that has a beginning, that has a development, a definite development that leads to a definite end. Now this plot, this sequence, this mythos, when noticed to have a very precise mechanistic structure, a numerical quality to its structure, the generation of Greeks that noticed this excerpted out the beginning, the middle, and the end, and said of this that this was the syllogistic form of logical speech that the mythic line of development from a definite beginning through a definite middle to a definite end, if kept in its sequence and that sequence in an alignment where the images were all of the same order, then one had a logical statement. So that logic was a combed mythos. Logic combs mythology. It brushes it and combs it, straightens it out. So that the image sequence is exact in terms of an abstract locus of the beginning exactly, the end exactly, and the middle brought into an exactness. So that one would have been very pressed in classical Greek times to argue about the beginning. The beginning was always something that could be ascertained. And the end could always be ascertained. And so the conflict, the argument, the debate, the discussion centered around the middle, the middle term, the development. This was brought into a severe question by uh, Plato's teacher. Plato's teacher, Socrates, is the first person to bring this whole process into suspect challenge. And what Socrates did was to show that the ritualistic bias as a substructure of language created a snare which would entrap people using language without sufficient mental balance so that language all by itself would either be skewed one way or another. It would be regressive in that it would become ritualistic, mechanical, and able to be agreed upon by a large number of people because it was ex exactly and only what it was, but that that reduced the effective range of what could be expressed. If everyone can agree that if A then B and if B then C, then certainly if you have A, there must be a C reached, otherwise you do not have completeness. But that form, while it can be agreed upon by thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of ordinary uh, users of language, you cannot apply that to very much of a range of intelligibility in the world. And yet, if you go the other way, the skew the other way, is that there is such a variation that imagination takes over. And so Socrates challenged on a full spectrum the whole use of language, that the assumed correct beginnings were highly suspect, that the agreement that people usually have 
is a cursory agreement that has a ritualistic tone to it and has nothing whatsoever to do with actuality other than the actuality of the agreement. That consensus of opinion is in no way an accurate guide of logical certainty. The Greek word for opinion was doxa. That the whole nature of logic by Socrates' time was simply scholastic exercises in opinion consensus making. And so too, and perhaps even to more extent, the end, the ends which were agreed upon, even as much as the beginnings, that the ends of language forms of their progressions, of their sequences. The famous um, Aristotelian syllogism that was used in the Middle Ages is almost an ironical um, uh, uh, regression. Uh, the sequence is um, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. That the beginning of this, Socrates is a man, is a consensus of opinion. But the end of it, therefore Socrates is mortal, is equally, simply, a consensus of opinion. And Socrates himself showed that the beginnings were always suspect, that the agreement was on the basis of opinion, not at all upon accurate perception, much less very accurate indexing conception, and that the development in the middle was not at all a matter of logical development or of language exploration of true possibilities, but was simply a rote variation on a ritual theme that preconditioned what one would get. So that preconception founded the beginnings, preconditioning held one in check and limited what you could do with it, and so to the end, the conclusions were extremely suspect, not only because the beginnings were suspect and the process of arriving through the middle was suspect, but even the nature of recognizing an end was in itself suspect. Not only was the process flawed at the beginning and in its development, but that the ability to recognize an end was also severely flawed, was severely compromised by a ritual predilection, which while regressive in the matter of beginnings, and even more regressive in the matter of how you proceed along in the developments, is fatal. The ritual regressive qualities are fatal in terms of ends because the end is usually something new, something that you have discovered. For if it's not something new, something that you have discovered, then you have simply argued in a circle. And logic in small circles was thought to be sophisticated because one could argue in large circles. <laughs> And Socrates showed that arguing in circles leads one into an entrapment of illusion, where you simply find new ways to explore how you're going to confirm that what you knew at first was exactly right and what everyone knows is just how it is, and one fortifies those preconceptions, those preconditions, and those presumptions. Because the ends, instead of being true ends that lead to something new, to something unknown previously, and just discovered, instead of ends being discoveries, ends were confirmations of what everybody knew. That whole process of ritualistic, suspect, regressive use of language was called in Socrates' day uh, wisdom. It's what passed for wisdom. And those who practiced it were wisdom people, 
they were called sophists, Sophia, wisdom. And the sophist was one who could teach wisdom. Whereas Socrates said, I am not a sophist, but I am a philosophist. I love wisdom, but I need to explore with you through language not only how we get to the ends, but those ends themselves and the very beginnings themselves. Let's explore everything. And in doing so, let's also explore language itself. Let's explore the phenomenon, the process of language itself. And the Socratic exploration of language showed again and again Plato's dialogues are reruns of the same investigation over and over again on ever sophisticated levels, taking again and again issues that initially everyone would have thought we know exactly what this is because this is ancient wisdom, is it not? This is consensus, which is tried and true, is it not? And in every single case, Socrates showed that this was not the case at all, that no one knew what they were talking about, and even worse, they did not know that the language they were using was severely maimed by regressive preconceptions, preconditions, presumptions. And so when we begin in two weeks with myth, with the expression of language, we need to look at the way in which the mythic context of language needs a very attentive concentration. Our attentiveness to language must initially have a fullness which is almost the fullness of a pregnancy. In fact, Socrates very often uh, termed himself, he said, I am a midwife of ideas. I have ideas to get born in you like a midwife does because my inquiries, my love of wisdom is like a fertility which impregnates you with something new that would like to get born, something in the interior world. It's like an idea is like a baby, like a child, like an embryo that's growing in the interior world. And birthing an idea is like that great triumph of the birthing of a new being, the delivery, the midwifing of a birth, of something coming out. And for Socrates, and for us, we're going to take a very serious look in terms of this metaphor, the birth, that language births something from the interiorization of experience. And we're going to use two women at the very beginning of mythology. One. We're going to use a woman named Jane Ellen Harrison, who was arguably the greatest of all the Cambridge dons at a time when Cambridge University was the very best in the world. At the turn of the 20th century in 1900, Cambridge University in England was clearly the best university in the world by far. The roster of professors and students there who became professors is like a telephone book. But in that group, Jane Ellen Harrison was perhaps the brightest star of all. And she's the one who took to task the entire British university system, said that the university system was based upon a Greek ideal. And in fact, English university learning was a mixture of classics and mathematics because both were very precise. And when you had classics and mathematics together, you had a university-trained man. You had the Cambridge man. She brought into suspect this entire play by saying that the accuracy 
uh, an exactness of the classical Greeks was very much an issue that needed to be dealt with. And so she said, of all the experiences of the Greeks that we have, the largest realm was Greek religion. And that far from being exact, Greek religion is characterized as much by mystery religions as it is by the exactness of the Parthenon. And she said, the time has not come when anyone understands us in enough depth to write a study of Greek religion. So her great book, many hundreds of pages, was called A Prolegomena to the Study of Greek Religion. That before you even begin to study Greek religion, this is what you have to consider. And her Prolegomena to the Study of Greek Religion is still in print a hundred years later almost. And it's still one of the greatest books of the 20th century because of the great exactness and variety of Jane Ellen Harrison's capacity. We're going to use her book, and we're also going to use a resonance of her book. She said before the Greeks, there were men and women, there were civilizations that were the basis of the Greek. And one of the foundations of Greek civilization was the ancient Near East. And before you can understand whether the Greeks were accurate or not, exact or not, trustworthy or not, one has to understand the template upon which they were based. The British are based upon the Greek, but the Greek were based upon the ancient Near East. And the most telling myths of the ancient Near East are either the myth of Gilgamesh or the myth of Inanna. And we're going to take the myth of Inanna. And the original myth of Inanna was written by a woman, the daughter of Sargon of Akkad, the great king, about 2300 BC. So that Inanna is a myth that takes place in written form 1,800 years before Pythagoras was ever born. So when we talk about the ancient Greeks as being a trustworthy basis for the British university system, like Jane Ellen Harrison, we're going to ask, what was the trustworthy basis of the Greeks? And going back to the ancient Near East, in this way, reminds us of the technique that Jesse L. Weston used in From Ritual to Romance. She said that the modern psyche, the modern psychological psyche of the person is based upon a classical mythic template, but that classical mythic template is based upon an ancient Near East template. And that where today we look to the classical myth, we have to look through the classical myth to the ancient Near East ritual to get the complete story. Otherwise, we do not get the ritualistic preconditioning that is invisible and hidden like snares in the mythology. And we develop ourselves on the basis of templates whose hidden jaws we do not see. And then we are shocked when our lives turn out to be voracious, atavistic reruns of the way life used to be 4,000, 5,000 years ago. And we wonder why we are not civilized, when we have done the very best we can. We have done the very best we can with a stacked deck. Let's take a break. ...through the evaporative propensities of imagination, the clouds of imagination, which when they accompany a stream of consciousness, lend a deep interiorized symbolism to the landscape. Mountains without streams would be a desert and barren, and so to ritual without mythic imagery. Turns out 
eventually to be very interesting structure geologically, very barren in terms of the fertility of life. So that a ritual reduction is not a good thing, whereas the ritual substrate geologically is a good thing. And so in terms of, remember in Ghostbusters, Bill Murray says to one of the men, he said, I'm a little fuzzy on the good and bad. Would you go over that one more time? <laughs> Existence is good. We need it. But to keep returning back to square one all the time is not good. We don't need that. It's all right occasionally to return back to square one, but if you keep on doing it, it's annoying. We would like to go forward. We would like to explore, to do something new. So that the braiding together in myth is a braiding of the ritual substructure with the image flow. And as the image flow gains its own climate, the clouds form, and the clouds are the beginning of a space of unknown, which become eventually the seed of the mind. So that, for instance, when this education comes to its pinnacle of integration, the book that we will use during that fourth interval at the end of symbols, at the end of the first year, at the very center of the course, is the cloud of unknowing. The cloud of unknowing was a medieval English, a Midlands English Upanishad. And one of the great phrases in the cloud of unknowing, this anonymous spiritual guide living in uh, Chaucer's day says, one of the great surprises is that when you explore the unknown open enough, long enough, you discover not only is the cloud of unknowing above you, but also has become below you, so that you are totally immersed in the cloud of unknowing. By the end of the year, we'll be able to talk about, to experience, to understand the deep poignancy of being suspended completely in the unknown and being able to navigate from that particular position. For that particular position is the seed of true consciousness. The bones of the mountains in a landscape painting are the ritual substructure and the meandering of the water, the waterfalls, the rivers, is the mythic structure. And the clouds and the spaces are the symbolic spaces that come out. In ritual, we have found that what's important is alignment. So that one of the earliest ritual experiences that survive into our own time is the alignment of stones, of rocks, like Stonehenge, or any ancient megalithic monument. The alignment of stone is one of the most primordial of all ritual tasks. And this alignment in ritual produces a vector. This vector, or this alignment, always has a complement to it. The vector that you see, the alignment of the stones, has another vector. That is, the alignment of the context. When you align the stones of Stonehenge, you not only align the stones themselves, but you align the heavens as a context above those stones so that you can sight along the alignment of the stones and make an alignment out of the stars, make an alignment out of the movements of the sun and the moon. 
so that the visible alignment at Stonehenge is in stone. The invisible alignment is in heaven. And man learns in ritual when it begins to develop a mythic, contextual braiding. Man learns that he relates directly to the largest scale of reality. That ritual is like a tyrone. In the Chinese context, it was always uh, presented as a lone fisherman in a boat on the water with a lot of mist and maybe a distant mountain. It's this quality that the ritual alignment is like a fishing line, or it's like a tether line. It tames the wild, savage nature, not destroying it, but making it possible for man to ride, for man to take an excursion with this wild, universal capacity. So that ritual alignment is always a double vector. It's a line that you see in stone in terms of megalithic monuments. It's an alignment in stars, or an alignment in seasonal processes, or an alignment of the complex spectrum of feelings that would be there during a whole year's life. If one tried to align all the feelings of a single day in a human being's life, you would be staggered by the monumentality. Could you align all the feelings of a year and remember it? Could you align the feelings of a lifetime of, say, 90 years? All this, human beings discovered, was possible once mythology became available. Now, written mythology became available somewhere around uh, 2200 BC. Before that, there are no written mythologies. There are oral mythologies, and they go back many millennia. In fact, oral mythologies go back tens of uh, millennia. Oral mythologies, as far as we can see, by the evidence made available to us through chance and through exploration, oral mythologies go back at least to about 30, 35,000 BC. So that we have almost 40,000 years of oral mythologies. Because the first evidence of an oral mythology is an alignment, one of the most primordial alignments of all the alignment of man with the plants and the animals. When the plants and the animals and man are brought into an alignment, one has almost the beginning, the middle, and the end. The plants as the beginning, the animals as the middle, and man as the end. And this visual alignment is the very first thing that we see in Paleolithic art. Now we call, just for reference sake, we call everything in the old stone world, Paleolithic, when man still worked with the given nature as it was, with plants and animals as they were. In the Neolithic, man works with the beginnings of numeracy, and the beginnings of numeracy about 10,000 years ago also coincide with the first developments of agriculture, of taming plants, of husbandry, of taming animals, of having domestic plants, domestic animals. And at the very same time, you have the development of the origins of cities of villages or hamlets that begin to become places. They become places because a pair of structures begins to occur. A temple as a fixed place occurs 
And related to it is a counting house, an accounting place, the place where the tokens in their envelopes would have been stored is always associated with the temple. So that there is a deep, pervasive archetype to the New Testament story of Jesus throwing the money changers out of the synagogue, out of the temple. That this is an old regressive combination that no longer should hold. Because in the inner temple, what room do you have for money? In, ter in terms of a gold disc with the face of a Roman emperor on it. Where in your mind's space can you put a gold coin? In other words, you have to reduce the mental space to some kind of accounting box. You have to make of your mental space a purse. And this would reduce a human being to a simple receptacle of thousands of year old, out of date uh, measure of value. So the entire uh, episode of throwing the money changers out of the temple is filled with deep, we would say by this time, an archetypal quality. That is to say, there's a ritual substructure that tends to pull one back and in pulling one back, reduces one from further levels of development, tethers one to the past. One of Thomas Jefferson's famous and favorite phrases was, the earth belongs to the living. That the dead hand of the past, no matter how wisely crafted then, those men and women are now dead. The earth belongs to the living. The living must reconfirm for themselves in their time what it is that they can use, what it is they choose to use, and that they have the freedom to let go of the past, even though it was wise in the past, their choice must take precedence now. The young have a right to set aside the wisdom of the past. One can only hope as an educator that they consider it in full consciousness before letting it go. For many things are of uh, great use. One thing that is of great use is to understand, as Jane Ellen Harrison or Jesse L. Winston, or many James or uh, George Fraser, many of those geniuses at the turn of the century who understood that the structures of the ritual past are the actual natural link to nature. And that if man dispenses with the old rituals across the board, he loses his contact with nature. He no longer has an alignment with the plants and the animals. And not knowing that there was even such a thing as an alignment with plants and animals begins to pollute and destroy nature under the aegis of progress or development. For remember that people, women like Jesse L. Western and Jane Allen Harrison, grew up in an England that in their childhood was being decimated by the Industrial Revolution. The first great chimneys spewing out black soot upon the green verdant landscape came from the Industrial Revolution about the 1820s, 1830s. In the 1830s, you have the first railroads being built everywhere in England. You have the first engineers as heroes who began to put steel constructs and gears everywhere. And so they grew up in an environment that was increasingly threatened. The kind of sensitive masculine psyches that occur generally occurred outside of the universities. A masculine counterpart to Jane Allen Harrison was W.B. Yeats. And we will look at some of Yeats's material later on. We'll look at A Vision by Yeats. 
and find that the pattern that we're applying now in our education, the method of inquiry that we're using, is a development from the legitimacy of Socrates right onto our own parent grand generation of Jane Ellen Harrison and Yeats, and right up to the future that's coming with a new star based civilization. All of this is in keeping. All of this has an alignment. Now notice that the, the alignment of man with plants and animals was through the bringing together of stone and stars. That the polarity of stone and stars, nothing could be further apart, heaven and earth. But when heaven and earth are brought together, are bridged by man, when man becomes the meat of the sandwich of heaven and earth, this is a nutritive meal. This is a nourishing of ourselves, which can continue life indefinitely. In fact, where the phrase in ancient times was broke without end. There is no limit. There are no limits on the capacities of men and women. We do not have to hope that some alien species is going to super evolve us into something else. We have plenty of room to grow. We have plenty of evolutionary energy. And our capacities, uh, even in uh, 20 or 30,000 years, will hardly even be um, developed. We have tremendous ability. The alignment of pairing stones and stars around the vector of aligning plants, animals, and men so that those three realms, those three worlds, are brought together. But look for just a second. The world of stone is also a realm of mineral and of metal. And the realm of the stars is also a realm of space of air, so that one could have an alignment here, so that heaven and earth are brought together and animals, plants, and men can be put in between so that you would have metals, plants, animals, men, and space. Here one begins to have a kind of a five-phase cycle which is characteristic of the Chinese civilization, the five-phase Taoist energy cycle. When this kind of alignment is made in Western wisdom, in the Western wisdom tradition, then it also has a five-quality. But the five-quality is symbolized by a star, by a five-pointed star, but by a particular kind of star that's made by a moving line that does not lift from the page. And so a star, a simple star that is made by a single line, it becomes a symbol of the complete wisdom of the entire cycle from nature to transcendence. That star, if it were pulled inarticulately through haste, would quickly become a knot. One of the ancient sayings is that with articulate development, one forgoes making the knots of adversary <laughs> quality, and then makes the bows of presence of future possibility. Our education seeks to show us how to tie bows rather than knots. And with a little bit of practice, a little bit of elegance, with a deeper wisdom, your bows will come out in the shape of hermetic stars. This is the kind of symbol that one will find. When we do, for instance, uh, myth, we start with Jane Ellen Harrison's prolegomena to Greek religion and with the story of Inanna, recovered from the Sumerian Akkadian by Samuel Morrow Kramer, 
and translated beautifully into a vibrant English by Diane Volkstein. So we'll have Diane Volkstein's translation of Inanna and Jane Allen Harrison's Prolegomena to Greek religion, study of Greek religion. That'll be the first pair of books in myth. But the second pair of books in myth will have Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture and Sir Green and the Green Knight. I'd like to use the Tolkien translation this time. J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, his, he was a great medieval scholar. And his translation of Sir Gwen and the Green Knight is very sensitive. And the symbol on the shield of Sir Gwen was that hermetic star, the gold star on the uh, vermilion background. Now, if you recall, I displayed that symbol several times on the table, setting up in a visual cue the development that will come in about two months. A visual cue that will show that the hermetic star is the Western hermetic five-phase energy cycle that fits with the Taoist five-phase hermetical cycle. And in a way, the hands of East and West come together and work together almost like two hands. The center of this entire realization in the West is to get the declension of the sequence of the alignment right. As long ago as 700 BC in India, the great Chandogya Upanishad gives the evolution of man and says that man is the essence of plants. Man is not declined in evolution from animals, but from plants. The essence of plants is man. The essence of man is speech. And the essence of speech is own. And so in the Chandogya Upanishad of 2,700 years ago, this alignment showing plants, man, speech, and symbol. Plants as representative of nature, the natural world, the flow of the natural world. Man as representative of the ritual realm of existence. Speech as representative of the flowing realm of myth. And Om as the presentational example of symbol. And so you have that nature, ritual, myth, symbol, square, already 2,700 years ago in the Chandogya Upanishad. This square is always a square made up of a pair of pairs. When you have a pair of pairs brought together, and you have that square, you have a stability of form which registers on the level of the plane. Paredness creates a resonance which is always the true source of the line. Paredness is always an alignment, a making of a line. So while nature makes certainly the mysterious point available, it's ritual that makes the line available by paredness. And by pairing the pairs in myth, we come to the first geometry, the first plane. So nature is like a point. Ritual is like a line. Myth is like a plane. And what would symbol be? Symbol is the revolution of the plane about itself, about its ritual alignment, making a sphere. For to imagine that a plane is a square is already a ritual assumption on the mythic level. 
that a plane should occur to us as a square is a preconditional holdover from the very original vestiges of our civilization. Whereas the conscious recognition is that the indefinite extent of a plane rotated would make an infinite sphere. The mathematical actuality of that is that of an infinite sphere. And in just this way, we can check ourselves and learn to have the consciousness to check ourselves to find out what kind of stones are in the very bones of the actions that we do that carry over into procedures that are no longer stone-like, but are in realms of, say, the mind. This is the way an education is of service to its students. The education is of service because it shows the way in which reality begins to discover and disclose its integral and notice that the integral here is a constant opening out into completeness. An opening into completeness. Midway through this opening into completeness, the point of the alignment of ritual begins to disclose an interiorization through language. And as language interiorizes, a whole plane of development, a geometrical plane, occurs as the interior horizon. The interior horizon is like a geometrical plane which is able to take formed shape. Figures are able to be developed, and the figures have a correlation with number. They have a ritual correlation with number, but geometrical figures also have a symbolic capacity which can be disclosed. But the symbolic capacity is developed not in terms of ritual numeracy, but in terms of symbolic sphericality. For the development of geometry to trigonometry is the beginnings of a symbolic mentality. Now the ability to write down trigonometrical functions, to write the symbolic reality down, comes much later than the ability to uh, evidence it orally. Oral symbolism is very ancient. But the ability to write it down in terms of conscious figuration of number is something that only occurred uh, in late antiquity. The Alexandrian mathematicians of um, Christian times, of Roman times, are the first time that there's enough development of mental space and symbolic accuracy to allow for the development of trigonometry. And the development of trigonometry is one of the great triggers of world-class civilization. In the Dark Ages, there were very few human beings who had enough mind to learn geometry, much less trigonometry. And it wasn't until uh, the Renaissance that there was an ability to incorporate the development of mathematical trigonometric functions into an educated mind enough to produce even a noticeable population of people who could, say, think in these terms. When the young mathematical genius John Dee went to Holland to study, he was found to be one of the great mathematical geniuses of the 1500s. And he was one of the first people to be able to appreciate Mercator's projection of a spherical world upon a flat sheet of paper to make a map of a round world on a geometrical plane surface. 
And Dee was one of the first human beings to understand that you can take trigonometric functions and apply them by adjustment to a geometrical plane. And John Dee was one of the first developers of the art of navigation because he understood the mathematics of it. And when someone tells you what was the power of the British Empire, and they answer it was because they had a navy, they had ships that could go anywhere in the world. Well, those ships went because somebody understood the mathematics of navigation and how to read maps, even of areas of the earth that were completely unknown or unknowable at the time, to be able to mathematically navigate into the unknown is a development of the Renaissance when it reached Northern Europe. And you find in Portugal and in Holland and in England the first indications of human beings who had symbolic space enough to navigate into the unknown. The unknown nature on the basis of being able to see it very clearly in their minds and to project it out in terms of a mythic language upon a geometry of ritual and carry it out in this way. So that the recapturing of ritual is not necessarily a regression. If you fall into it, it's a regression, but if you make use of it as a tool, if you incorporate it into a higher ordered mix, then you have uh, the beginnings of consciousness. This education specifically teaches us how to navigate into an unknown future. We are not only is the future unknown, but our own capacities are unknown and presently unknowable. And it allows us to get, navigate in such a way that we will learn about ourselves and our capacities at the same time as discovering the unknown. So this education develops us to the point to being able to live in a cloud of unknowing indefinitely and not panic, but simply to proceed from nowhere to nowhere if need be, or from anywhere to nowhere, from nowhere to anywhere, from somewhere to nowhere to anywhere, the coordinates of multidimensional differential consciousness are indefinite, if not infinite, and certainly eternal. Now, ritual existentiality, the existence of things on ritual level, is indexed by language. Language is like at the end of the book, it indexes the entire structure. Every capacity of ritual is accessible instantly by someone who is a master of language. Someone who masters language then literally is someone who is magical in view of the farmers in the field and the shepherds in the hills. And those who master the taming of plants and those who master the taming of animals, and even though it seems impossible, there are those who master the taming of men. But all three of them, the farmer, the shepherd, and the king, are out-indexed by the wizard, by the magician, by someone who understands language to the point of symbolic mentality. Someone who is able to take the interiorized world to the realm of integration, where language matures to the point of symbolic capacity. That person can teach farmers about plants, can teach shepherds about animals, and can teach kings about men. Hence the very archetypal Arthurian mythos starts not with Arthur, but with Merlin. Without a Merlin, there's no Arthurian mythos at all.
So one needs to look at the capacities of both, and we're going to spend three months on it. But let's look for a moment here at Basho. Let's come to Basho, the narrow road to the deep north. We've paired Basho and the Grail together. We've concluded our investigation of ritual by making the haiku and the grail focuses. That the haiku is a sudden insight, but the grail is an ancient tradition myth. Ancient tradition spread indefinitely and sudden insight appearing instantly. So that those two are like the polar ends of possibility of existence. Something which occurs only once and only instantaneously, and something which occurs eternally, always, in the same way. One could say, the surprise instant and the universe. And when these polar ends are brought together, one has the complete spectrum, then, of the possible. That realm, whatever extent it is, is the realm of the possible. And our education seeks to acquaint us with the entirety of the possible. For when we have essayed navigation on the possible and have come to appreciate our capacities to do so, then it will not come as a surprise when the second year we are shown how to navigate the impossible, the improbable, the unlikely. And this is a realm which can equally be navigated by human beings, by men and women. Ritual pairs become mythic squares. Ritual pairs become mythic squares. A ritual as a line of development, as a vector, which occurs naturally, integrating in paired vectors, stones and stars. Every alignment produces a, another alignment, the visible with an invisible. We're always there together. And when ritual pairs are paired, one then gets a mythic plane. One gets the shape of experience. Experience comes to us in shaped form. Without shaped form, experience, like a fog, does not really record. It obtrudes on the edges and is not recognizable. A whiff is not an odor. Whereas if odor can once recognized, once experience builds up a taste, could become a fragrance that's preferred. There is such a thing as the inability to even imagine form on the basis of experience. For instance, when art, when painting, was first being introduced to the Inuit, to the Eskimos, they were asked to draw a tree, and no Eskimo had ever seen a tree. And so a tree was described to them, and the sketches of that tree are still extant in the Canadian National Museum. They're like little pointed surrealistic items. They're not trees at all. When a population of Eskimo men and women and children were shown an old film from the 1920s, a silent film, and the camera was panning uh, from the air showing New York City. The Eskimos sat there and nothing recorded. They didn't see New York City. They just saw images on that screen which had no meaning whatsoever. They would not have recognized a vast home of eight million people at all. It was not recognizable because they had never had the experience, shapes, that allowed for that. There are realms of experience available now at the dawn of the 21st century on this planet alone 
that simply dwarf like a symphony the little pipsqueak interjections that pass as culture. And our capacities are just beginning. We need an education to be able to at least appreciate the fantastic treasure that's here now. Now when Basho begins the narrow road to the deep north, his beginning reads like this. Days and months are travelers of eternity. So are the years that pass by. So that time designations are forms, days, months, years. These time forms occur on the mythic plane of experience. They are shapes of experience. And because they are shapes of experience, they have a root in the ritual alignments, the ritual vectors. So that the very act of traveling, of moving along a vector, a ritual vector, a ritual alignment, of moving along mountains and streams, a landscape of northern Japan. The very act, the ritual act of journeying here brings out the mythic plane in such a way that this experience has within it fertile nodes of recognition. And those fertile nodes of recognition are like the impulsive interiorization of experience to the point of symbolic recognition. Those are the haiku. So if you did a computer plot on this, super cray, and you made a mythic horizon, and the mythic horizon was enriched enormously, but had within it a very powerful pair of vectors, an alignment of the visible and a co-alignment of the invisible structuring of the motion forward, the arrowing of direction, the vector itself in both its visible and the invisible prowling, there would occur within an ever-enriched context in which this would happen, there would occur little vortexes, little whirlwinds, like taking oars and rowing about, and the oars going through the water make little whirlpools around where the oars are. There would be vortexes which occur. And the more powerful the alignment and the direction of those vectors going through an ever-enriched solution, the more that the vortexes would occur and survive and stay. And so symbols are born in just this kind of high, mystical, integral way. The more experience is enriched so that the soup, the stew of experience becomes extremely rich the more powerful the ritual vector and its invisible complement vector, the more that one has the possibility of symbols occurring, of the symbolic taking definite shape. And it's just in this way, with like Basha and Nero wrote to the deep north, his book begins with days and months or travelers of eternity, so are the years that pass by, that time designations have this ritual vectoring and also generate the mythic plane. That's the beginning of the book. What is the end of the book? At the very end of the book, his co-traveler, Soya, Soya wrote, in this little book of travel, the mythic plane, the travel. In this little book of travel is included everything under the sky. And then he proceeds to give us a pair of pairs that make the square 
that is under the sky. Not only that which is hoary and dry, that is to say, old and uh, uh, desiccated, but also that which is young and colorful. There's a pair, old and young, desiccated and colorful. A pair of pairs. So there's a square. Yet there's another square, not only that which is strong and imposing, but that which is feeble and ephemeral. Strong and feeble. Um, imposing and ephemeral. Now when you bring two planes together, two squares together like that, and intersect them, you get a cross of planes which is another way of showing a spiritality, but showing it symbolically in a new way. By showing it in its ritual bones, in terms of its experiential feeling. The rotating of a single plane to make a sphere is a trigonometric symbolic function. But the positioning of two planes together is like raising the mythic horizon of experience almost directly to that realization that culminates the symbolic. When one has a single plane that rotates to make the sphere, to find the center of the sphere, one has to do some trigonometric computation vis-a-vis -vis the sphere. When one has two planes that come together, and make that sphericality, the ritual vector alignment is already the center all along the way. Any spot in the journey is the center. And so in this Zen way, for the narrow road to the deep north that we're using it in ritual, is also a very high work of art. One of the combinations of East Asia civilization. Basho is as sophisticated as Wittgenstein in language. He understands precisely and exactly the N-level developments of meaning. So that when you have a beginning like Basho, time, forms, or like travelers of an eternity, and an ending like Surya's pair, pairs, and planes crossing, and the middle is the Zen travel journey itself, then the reader who brings himself there and reads through the travel journey also participates from that exact beginning to that exact end in just this way. Basha's narrow road to the deep north is again and again and again a journey which happens every time someone takes it. For our experience, and existential actuality makes that journey real. Every time someone reads it and takes that journey, that journey is taken again. And it happens pristinely for the first time ever now. To put an eternal nowness into a form is very, very high art. In the Zen tradition, a thousand years before Basho, the sixth patriarch in China, who had inherited the patriarch responsibility of passing on enlightenment, Hunan, decided to make a trigonometric function of enlightenment and to raise it for all eternity. And so instead of having a seventh patriarch to which he would pass it on, he rotated the entire dharma in such a way that it broadcast out so that anyone at any time who would ever make the real